Excuse me. One in a hundred Detroiters has the edge of dread. One in a hundred Detroiters gets dread discounts on albums, clothes, concert tickets, sports, movies, and even food. Now Dread through WREF presents the gold card worth even more discounts at stores all over Detroit. Trade in your old card for gold. Remember the first time you stepped into an arena to witness a collision of good versus evil. The excitement in the air. The roar of the crowd. And of course, the blood. It's time to relive those memories big time. A historical wrestling lesson taught by your professors, the legendary Terry Sullivan and Supermouth Dave Drayson. Rocks TV and International Big Time Wrestling present Big Time Memories. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Big Time Memories. Terry Sullivan, Dave Drayson, and today we're going to continue to speak about one of the greatest all time wrestlers the world's most dangerous wrestler himself, Mr. William Fritz Aflis. And you're saying, who? Better known as that guy, Dick the Bruiser. This is the second part. There's just so much about Bruiser, obviously, not just because of his the length of his career, but because of all the things he accomplished as being one of the legit, top, elite professional wrestlers of, of all time. Oh, no doubt about it. Yeah. And just to recap a little bit, uh, you know, he grew up in, you know, Lafayette, Indiana, and or Indiana, and his mother was into politics, and he, you know, he got kicked off the Purdue football yeah, team yeah, for <laughs> hitting the well. coach with his helmet, didn't take you know, to that well and all. didn't play another, he transferred to the University of Nevada, never played another football game, <laughs> but still made it into the <laughs> National Football League. Well, with, he, he went to Nevada, and then the, the, the school dropped football. Yeah, right? you know, the it's year after coming. he gets there, <laughs> you know, and then, you know, uh, you know, I can tell you that during his rookie year, he uh, was working for one of the men who was in charge of network television. Back in the day when he only had three or four channels on the television, uh, professional wrestling was sort of a, 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 a constant on at least one of the network channels. So now you're getting nationwide, if not regional, exposure to some of these guys. Mm -hmm. During Bruiser's rookie year, he worked for Fred Kohler, who was the promoter in Chicago and supplied talent for Detroit, Cincinnati, all throughout uh, other areas of Michigan mm -hmm. and other states as well. But Kohler had the network TV on the Dumont Network out of Chicago. And uh, so Bruiser became one of the stars there. So now people all around the country are seeing him and they want him to wrestle, promoters want him to wrestle on their cards. And, of course, his asking price is just astronomical as well it should be at that point in time. Yeah, we brought up the point that, uh, you know, he made his debut and you know at the Olympia Stadium, uh, I think it was in 1959, and he headlined the next 39 out of 41 shows That's there. That's just amazing. Yeah. And then the, the, the incident that a lot of people talk about, oh, Bruiser was banned for life from New York State or Madison Square Garden. No, wasn't true. We told you all about that. Bruiser came back several times after the event that we're talking about. The event was a riot. Uh, yep. Bruiser basically was responsible for, it was a tag team match with Edward Carpentier in Argentina Rocca against Dr. Jerry Graham. No, with Dr. Jerry Graham. Bruiser and... and Dr. And, Jerry Graham. Yeah, yeah, against Rocca and Carpentier. Yeah. And a little riot after that, and... Uh, uh, a lot of people got hurt, and thousands of chairs got destroyed, and uh, they, they say Bruiser was banned for life. He wasn't, although the rule that was instituted, legit, children under 14 were not allowed to attend yeah. events at Madison Square Garden. For many years. 30 years yeah, yeah. after that, yeah. You know, in the incident in Detroit that we brought up at the, you know, big fight, you know, oh, with yeah. him and Alex Karras at yeah. the Lindell AC, and, yep. you know, uh, the commission, you know, Michigan State Athletic Commission, Charles Davey Chairman, uh, <laughs> really banned him. 
yeah. you know, so he was banned from Detroit. Yeah, you know? cost him 50 grand to get back in. Yep, but well. he still had his, you know, Indianapolis WWA promotion, and things were going, you know, gravy for him. Yeah. And that's a recap of last week's show, and brought you back up to date. And we left the show, and I said, you know, uh, Dick the Bruiser, who started, you know, a lot of guys, gave him a lot of, you know, uh, time to develop their characters, stuff like that, work his promotion. But probably the biggest name of all to me, uh, good friend, loved the guy. People hated him, but then people loved him many years later. Bobby Heenan. Oh, that's who you're talking about? Yeah. You know, okay. Bobby Heenan started uh, for the Bruiser's promotion at a young age, probably like uh, 13, 14, I would say. Uh, he was, you know, selling Cokes and popcorn, and he was taking the ring jackets back to mm -hmm. the dressing room for him. So, you know, he had a little bit of an in there, and somehow uh, he wanted to become a manager, and Dick the Bruiser gave him the chance. And I think his first uh, foray in it, didn't he manage uh, Angelo Poffo and Chris Markoff? The Devil's Duo. Right. Right. And then he went on to manage the, was it the Assassins? Assassins, Tommaso and Guy Mitchell, the yep. Stomper. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, Dick, uh, Bobby worked for him for many years, yeah, you know. Yeah. And uh, as Bobby tells the story, he was abused by him, you know, many times. Just yeah. bruiser, just, you know. A lot of times, Bruiser, you know, took liberties with a lot of people. Yeah, including our... Good friend. World-renowned New York Raymond. <laughs> Raymond Selby. Yeah. New York Raymond worked for Bruiser. New York was a manager. Um, and he, he was basically comic relief for Dick the Bruiser. And a Bruiser, like you say, would, would abuse him. But he, Raymond was known as Captain Willie. There's some video out there on YouTube with Captain Willie with the Assassins and then Captain Willie with, with Bruiser. But the, the story that a lot of people like to tell is the time that Bruiser took a rope and tied up New York <laughs> Raymond and threw him in the swimming pool. Yeah, left him for dead. <laughs> and then wasn't it Guy Mitchell? It was Guy Mitchell who eventually the people thought, this is Dick, this is no longer a joke. Dick, you need to get him out of there. And Dick was just sitting there, <laughs> probably puffing his guitar. Yeah. Hey, cigar. <laughs> puffing his guitar. <laughs> what have you been smoking? Have you seen smoking guitars? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, well, New yeah, York they, Raymond. Guy, Guy Mitchell finally got uh, New York Raymond out so he could live to sell body presses for years in memoriam. Yep. And, you know, we brought up on the last show that uh, Dick the Bruiser, you know, uh, tried to run against the Sheik promotion in 1965, you know, filming TV at the Leland Hotel in downtown Detroit. And he ran shows through March, April and May. So only that only lasted three months. But let's bring up the biggest challenge. It was in 1971 that. Dick the Bruiser uh, went to the uh, Michigan State Athletic Commission and, you know, asking to get, you know, a promoter's license back. But he was still banned from, you know, the police officers and lawsuits that he had against them. But I guess he ended up settling the police lawsuits. Um, and then on, he got his promotion license and he was going to promote at the Olympia once again with Lincoln Cavallari and Lou Marutis. Lou Marutis, exactly. So that first show that he was going to have happened on October 23rd, 1971. And that's a uh, memorable one for me because it was only like not even my first year working for the Sheik's big time wrestling as their photographer. And a lot of my good friends were on the show, you know, uh, Baron Von Roschke, Bobby Heenan, Blackjack Lanza. And it's like, oh, my God, there's, there's some way I've got to go see my friends at this show. And it was a historic thing, Dick the Bruiser coming back to Detroit. Yeah. Um, you know, he was uh, had TV on Channel 9, you know, CKLW out of Windsor. And, you know, they were making a big, you know, thing for, sure. you know, his return. Yeah. And in return, you know, we know what happened. The Sheik's, you know, uh, brought in a lot of the NWA promoters talent, you know, from all over the country and, you know, going to go head to head. Let's go at it. Mm -hmm. You know, and Bruiser, you know, had his first show. 
drew okay, I guess. I guess he had maybe five, six thousand. You know, not it was bad. not bad there. Yeah. You know, uh, I think he went against uh, Baron Von Roschke for the title. Mm -hmm. I think Roschke had the title at that time, and Bruiser ended up winning the mm -hmm. title. So he's so, drawn 5,000 at Olympia. Meanwhile, across town is probably 9, 10, 11. Yeah, um, um, up until, people. you know, we had that big run of, you know, how many sellouts Seven in a row. Seven consecutive sellouts, yeah. Boy, I remember those days. Oh, God, yeah. they were great. You know, so I did, you know, I ended up going to that first Bruiser show. You know, I talked to Lou Marutis and stuff, and he gave me a press pass, and I went there and, you know, took photographs up at the ring. But unbeknownst to them, I was also sort of like a spy for Sheik. <laughs> you, know, you know, hey, you know, tell us, you know, how many people are there. Let us know, you know, what this and that and the other. So, the, you know, with the, his blessing, I went there, you know, for that initial show, and that's the only show I ever went to there for them. But, you know, he lasted uh, almost uh, you know, a few years. two and a half, yeah. three years there. Yeah. You know, I think they beat big time wrestling at least once, maybe twice, but not on a regular basis. No, maybe one time that they did beat him. Remember, I think there was, a, you know, because the Sheik was running weekly at that time. Yeah. And he would make sure that he ran against, you know, the Bruiser show. And I think just because, you know, I'll say like a year prior, you had to book Kobo. So the Sheik would book every two weeks. Mm -hmm. So he had those dates locked up. And when Bruiser would wanna run a show on one of the nights that the Sheik wasn't running, well, Sheik would, you know, ask Kobo, you know, is this date open? And he always ran against him. If he didn't get Kobo, he ran against him at uh, the state fairgrounds. And I remember one time in Kobo Hall, the Hall B, B. <laughs> show, you know, and that may have been one show that he outdrew, you know, yeah. uh, the Sheik yeah. on. Because, you know, the Hall B, it was, you know, like a flat floor. Yeah. There was no risers, no yeah. anything. It's like all the seats were set up on the flat floor. Yeah. So if you were back in row, you know, triple Z, <laughs> you, know, right. you, know, yeah. the, you know, you had, you know, Andre the Giant looked like, you know, <laughs> you know, sky low low from as far back as you were. But, uh, yeah, uh, and that, you know, like I said, his promotion at the Olympia lasted, uh, you know, uh, up until February 22nd, 1974 was his last show uh, at the Olympia. Uh, and it was, you know, Dick the Bruiser... I think Bruiser and the Crusher went against uh, Cowboy, no, no, Dick the Bruiser and Cowboy Bob Ellis went against the Valiants. Oh. That was the last, uh -huh. you know, show. Yeah, Crusher didn't come in that much, did he? No, uh, no, he came in later, you know, yeah. once the things got rolling. I know Crusher came in. Yeah. Uh, Bruno San Martino right. came in. Sure, and that was a big Yeah. Help. Oh, well, God, when he was working with the Crusher, that was always fun. Sure. Because, you know, you know, drinking beer and dancing yeah. with the dollies. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but the one thing that always interested me is the Sheik got help from all the fellow NWA promoters and would right. stack the card with all these huge stars from other territories. But didn't seem to happen that much with Bruiser specifically. Where was Vern Gagne? Yeah. You know, where was Bachwinkle? You know, well, they the, had their own territory, well, so sure, they were also running. So did these other NWA guys. Well, that was but, the thing on the Bruiser's shows. They had the same talent almost, yeah. you know, for the longest time. Yeah. And, you know, the only, you know, changes were when they brought in the Crusher and maybe Bruno, yeah. you know. Uh, that's the only, you know, changes that they yeah. had. Yeah. Um, you know, um, but then, you know, somehow, you know, Bruiser, you know, accepted defeat, you know, somehow I wasn't there. I, were, do you have any information on, you know, how they settled, you know? No, other than part of the settlement was the Sheik would run some shows at Olympia. Yeah. Maybe it was to finish out whatever Bruiser had already contracted for. Um, but other than that, it was just uh, the Sheik would do... Bruiser, Sheik against Bruiser matches in Detroit, and Sheik would go to Indianapolis and wrestle yep. Bruiser there. He also wrestled him in Fort Wayne, another Bruiser city, but that was it. I think they each went back and forth, you know, three or four matches maybe in each place. Yeah. Well, the, I think the first one, when they built up the Dick the Bruiser versus the Sheik, 
I think that was in August of 74 was in the, yeah. that they had that one. And it didn't sell out. No. You know, and I, you know, you would think Sheik versus Dick the Bruiser. Boy, that hasn't happened in how many years in Detroit? That's what uh, they were thinking. Yeah. Uh, but I think it was because of the Olympia itself. In a bad neighborhood, you know, back at that time, even though they had free, plenty of free lighted parking in the back, <laughs> it's like, yeah. you know, the security in that parking lot wasn't too good either. And people drive by and say, oh, free cars, let's go take one. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, they, you know, had their, you know, couple bouts at Kobo, and then they had the cage match there, and, you know, they drew good at Kobo. They drew well, yeah. but nowhere near what they expected to. No, not at all. Uh, but the one thing is when Dick the Bruiser had his uh, promotion, you know, rival promotion going in Detroit, uh, Sam Muchnick in St. Louis, who Bruiser was on all his shows all the time, a lot of times in the main events or semi-main mm -hmm. event, uh, Sam Muchnick being, a, you know, NWA member, you know, banned Bruiser from working in St. Louis. Not willingly. Not willingly. <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, Bruiser was money to him there. Yeah. And they were good friends, too. Oh, sure. Yeah. Bruiser had an enormously successful run in St. Louis yeah. for, for years and years, if not a couple of decades. Yep. I mean, he was in and out of the main events. He, the people really believed in him there. Yeah. He was the enforcer. He was going to get it done. Yeah. And I don't think people in St. Louis really knew why Bruiser wasn't coming to the, you know, Probably on the not. cards anymore. No. You know, but, you know, after, you know, they settled, you know, Sheik and Bruiser settled their difference, you know, he was back and working in St. Louis again. Mm -hmm. Uh Work and see when Bruiser had his promotion in India, based out of Indianapolis. Anyway, uh, there was a guy who had a local TV show, local talk show, and people know him from other things now. But David Letterman, oh yeah, you know, had a independent little TV show in 1980 well, in was, Indianapolis. It was uh, that one was NBC. Yeah. He was on the network. Yeah. He was a morning show. Right, exactly. Stiffed. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, he liked wrestling. And Dick the Bruiser being local, he brought Dick the Bruiser in on his TV show. Yeah. And he was so impressed with the Bruiser that he named uh, Paul Schaefer and the band the world's <laughs> most dangerous band. Yeah. After right. Dick the Bruiser, sure. you know, the world's most dangerous wrestler. Yeah. And, you know, uh, God, he, had, you know, starting, you know, in the 50s, he just had such a great career, you know, mm. everywhere he went. You know, I mean, he was champion in Detroit and in Indianapolis, of course. Uh, his, you know, big, you know, run in L.A., you yeah. know. Oh, Japan, mercy sake, he, you know, worked Japan, you know, him and the Crusher, you know, just, you know, riots, you know, but a riot in Japan is like yeah. people, you know, standing up and say, hey, you know, that's a riot. <laughs> because people in Japan at their shows, they're very, they were very polite. You yeah. know, if they liked something in the ring, they'd applaud. Mm -hmm. You know, they, you know, weren't getting up and, you know, yelling and no. screaming. That just no. wasn't, you know, their thing. Yeah. But with Dick the Bruiser there, I mean, he's brawling outside the ring and stuff, you know, fans... Just sitting there, you know, patiently watching it, and, you know, mm -hmm. and that would have been, you know, a start of a riot anywhere yeah, in the country sure. here. Yeah. And he retired uh, February 25th, 1989, uh, in Muncie, Indiana. He had his last match against the Golden Lion. Oh. Now, I think the Golden Lion wasn't that... To be his future son-in-law, I think his name was Tim... R Tim Rapogel. Yeah. Rapogel. Yeah. Who's who, the Golden Lion. Yeah, I think he was one of the sons-in-laws. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, the, so the Golden Lion... Um, and he's the guy today, now, even, who's Dick the Bruiser Jr. Dick the Bruiser Jr., yeah. yeah. You guy's know, good, good guy. Good guy, Dick though. The yeah. But Dick the Bruiser also had a son, Carl. Right, yeah. Who, who wrestled. Uh, as 
Leroy Redbone. <laughs> I, don't, I thought, boy, you could have come up with a better yeah. name, you know, because when I saw that name and you know his son wrestling, I I immediately thought of Leon Redbone. Yeah, you know exactly. the one hit yeah. one. Yeah. Wasn't he a one hit wonder? Oh no, he was around for quite a while. He come and get your nub or something like yeah. that. Is this one song? <laughs> but and, and and Leroy didn't look a thing like Bruiser. No, didn't look like him at all. Yeah, and we're talking about, you know, Dick the Bruiser Jr., uh, Tim Merpogel, uh, but also <laughs> Dick the Bruiser's son-in-law's, you know, uh, Spike Huber. Right. You know, really good guy. What yeah. a great worker he was. Um, and then Scott Romer. Yep. Scott Romer, he worked as a manager, Saul Creechman, was it? Yep. Yeah. You know, no relation or anything, you know, to Eddie Creechman, no, you know, no. who managed the Sheik and, you know, Abdullah the Butcher and so many others. But, mm. you know, uh, three wrestling, you know, related son-in-laws for Dick the Bruiser. Cuts the talent fees quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. Well, if they got any payoffs. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. But then I remember in 1982, uh, we had our WFIA convention in Indianapolis, oh. you know, with Dick the Bruisers, you know, he welcomed us there, uh, you know, gave us, you know, access to his talent and stuff. And it's like he showed up to our banquet, him, Guy Mitchell was there. I think Frankie Lane was there. Uh, who was the one guy, Bob Boyer? Oh, yeah. Bob Bobby Boyer. Bobby Bold Eagle. Bobby Bold Eagle. Yeah. yeah, he was there. Uh -huh. uh, a couple other guys, too. But, yeah. you know, at that convention, uh, Dick the Bruiser was awarded uh, Wrestler of the Year. No kidding. Yeah. Wow. And prior, you know, to the uh, convention of that, you know, we I was there, you know, because I was on the board of directors. Uh, me, Don Wilson, and, you know, a few others, you know, we get there earlier in the week to set things up and mm -hmm. get things going. Uh, but Sam Muchnick was there, oh. and we had to go to Dick the Bruiser's house. I guess Muchnick and him had to talk about something or other, you know. And, you know, myself, Sam Muchnick, Don Wilson, Judy Wilson, you know, we go to Bruiser's house. So we show up. And Dick the Bruiser's outside in his pool, you know, so naked. <laughs> he, he was swimming naked. <laughs> so it's like, you know, we walk in and it's like, you know, uh, you know, us guys didn't care. Maybe much Nick did, but Judy Wilson there. And it's like, you know, he grabbed a towel and put that around him. <laughs> and it's like, and then I hear from the roof, hey, Dave, how you doing? It's like. <laughs> doing work on Bruiser's roof. His son-in-law is Spike Huber. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and of course. I, I, I may have a picture, too, that I can <laughs> share. I think I have a picture of him doing something up yeah. on the roof. I took a picture of him. Well, the pool was, was basically the office during warmer weather. That's what I've heard from so many people is that's where he would do business. He would plop there his cigars and his beer and Wilbur Snyder, and they do business. Yeah. Well, you know, he had the lounge chair and all that other kind of stuff back there, and he was always into tanning. Yeah. You know, you got to maintain that tan. Did he have a big house? Not really. You know, you would think that, uh, you know, for Dick the Bruiser and you know, all yeah. the money he had, it was a modest house. Yeah. You know, but he had a house in Florida, too, right? Yeah. So but, mm -hmm. you know, modest house, you know, mm -hmm. you know, a nice neighborhood and stuff like that. Uh -huh. But I remember him, uh, I don't remember, but I remember reading uh, that, you know, when Dick the Bruiser was a child, you know, growing up, I can't remember, it might have been in Lafayette, Indiana, his, because his parents were, you know, pretty well-to-do. They had the biggest house in the city. Oh, wow. You know, so I can imagine, you know, an old Victorian house that, you know, yeah. he lived in and, you sure. know, when he was young. So, but it was nothing like the one he had in Indianapolis yeah. that, you know, I went to. It was probably rarely there, so maybe But I did, sense. I did see a couple of floating pennants. And things oh, like yeah. that. I think <laughs> New York Raymond must have been in that pool at one time or another. <laughs> but also, you know, Dick the Bruiser related things. Uh, in Detroit, on WRIF radio, you know, back in the 80s. Baby. You know, it would have been, yeah, uh, Arthur Penhallow. Arthur P. Yeah, but uh, there was a guy, Jim Johnson had a partner, George Beyer, who was the comic, you know, relief the on the man. show. Yeah. Yeah, the voice guy. And he did a Dick the Bruiser imitation. Yep. 
you know, and, you know, it became really big. You know, yeah. people just loved to, you know, hear him on the radio anytime Dick the Bruiser. And he did comic stuff, too. Yeah. So it made, made yeah. Bruiser look like an idiot yeah. sometimes, or, you of. know, a jokester. And, yeah. But it was really popular in Detroit, yeah. and everybody was imitating it, you know, which I did, too. And they and did I, commercials with yeah. the real Dick the Bruiser. Exactly. And I th I have a picture of that, too. Yeah. A poster that uh -huh. I still have um, with Dick the Bruiser promoting the WF. I think he had the WIF shirt on and, you know, he's posing. And yeah. I think I've got a picture of that to show you people. And But he made his last in-ring appearance, uh, even though he retired, you know, before in 1989. Uh, but he his last in-ring appearance was on December 16th. 1990 in St. Louis at the Keel Auditorium, and he was a referee uh, in a match with uh, Sting versus the Black Scorpion, you know, who, you know, you didn't think, you know, much of, you know, who the Black Scorpion is, but it turned out that, you know, Sting won the match and the Black Scorpion was unmasked. And it was Ric Flair. Oh. You know, I was really shocked. I didn't know Ric Flair yeah. worked under a mask at any time. But also, you know, Dick the Bruiser, you know, in his hometown, you know, uh, just, you know, he always gave back. Yeah. You know, he was big uh, with oh, the kids, yeah. with yeah. the kids. Lots of hospital visits and uh, things like that. Yeah. He worked a lot of Shriner uh, benefits, you know, uh -huh. with the kids. And I remember, I think I might have a picture, too, of... A bumper sticker that he'd always pass out, and you were a bruiser buddy. Oh yeah, right. Yep, the bruiser yeah. buddy stickers. Yeah, and uh, he ended up passing away, uh, unfortunately, on November tenth, nineteen ninety one, and I think he, you know, uh, died uh, while. Working was, out. Yeah, he was lifting weights. And he ruptured a blood vessel or something in his neck. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, you know, great career and yeah. stuff. Lasted well, till. You, you know, Dave, you, you, just when you think you've covered almost everything. What? Bruiser Bedlam. Oh, my Lord, how could I forget that? <laughs> Many people well, have. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I wasn't involved in Bruiser Bedlam, oh. uh, but you were. I you know, was, tell, yeah. tell us, Tell us about... And, you know, there's another thing he did, too. Remember when he did uh, co-commentary for Glow, the gorgeous oh, ladies gee. of wrestling, with David McLean? <laughs> See, and I first found out about the Bruiser Bedlam thing, and I was basically out of the you know business at that time, but they ran shows at the Premier Center in Sterling Heights, Michigan. Right. Uh, and not too far, because I was living in Sterling Heights at that time. Uh, but prior to Bruiser Bedlam coming in, Ricky Cortez was running shows at the Premier Center. Oh, really? And it was sort of, uh, how can we say, run by uh, mafia or, you know, mafioso or, you know, Castronosa or, you know, yeah, because, you know, Premier Center, they had, uh, you know, bring in Dean Martin, Frank Sinatra, all these big sure. name acts, you know, and, you know, big name, Dick the Bruiser, Bruiser yeah. Bedlam, tell yeah. me about it. Well, it was uh, an, an idea that some money people, some people with money had, to capitalize on Bruiser's fame in Detroit, not only from the WRIF exposure, but also from a few years before. It was about a dozen years had gone by, 10 years maybe, since Bruiser's last time in Detroit against the Sheik. And um, anyway, they wanted to do wrestling. They wanted wrestling for past TV. They wanted a wrestling yeah. show, and that wasn't a universally popular decision at pass. You know, some of the people considered that uh, wrestling was nowhere near a legitimate sport and it was very much beneath them. And for those of us on the front lines at the Premier Center, that's pretty much the way we were treated by the lovely pass staff. Oh. Not so much the camera people and the audio people, but the the producers and the director and everything. And I can always remember one time, they, they, Bruiser and I were out getting ready to do the opening for a show. And I said, what do you want, 30 or 60? Meaning 30 seconds or 60 seconds. It was just a rundown of what was going to come up on that day's show. And we couldn't get an answer. 
And are you guys ready? Well, as soon as we find out if we're going to get a, th if you want a 30 or a 60. And this went on for like three or four times, and I was starting to get hot. I really was. And I said to Bruiser, I said, F this. Let's go. And we walked off the set. Wow. Now, who, you know, I know you were the TV commentator for him, but uh, even though it was called Bruiser Bedlam, Bruiser wasn't wrestling at that time. Not on that program. They did not want him to wrestle because of his age. Uh, he was wrestling, though, in the places where that TV show aired, the regular, you know, Detroit at the arena shots, the non-TV shots, okay. Toledo, Indianapolis, Fort Wayne. He was still wrestling. But after we walked off the set, you'd be amazed at how quickly they came up with, yeah, let's do a minute, okay, thank you very much, okay. Pretty now, simple, right? So was Bruiser the promoter of Bruiser Bedlam? Not or really, he was no. just a name? Just the name. The, the 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 guy who was really doing the negotiation with Pass was Dr. Jerry Graham Jr. Okay. Uh, Jerry, Chris Carter, Gary Warrenchak were the ones who did most, if not all, of the legwork uh, the day of as well as leading up to the, the various shows. Now, some of the guys... On, that were on Bruiser Bedlam. I mean, they went on to great careers, but weren't the Steiner brothers? Just Scotty. Scott was on uh, very early in his career. Muhammad Jihad Saad, I mm -hmm. mentioned. Chris Carter. Uh, we had Cowboy Rex Bodie. Cousin Junior, remember him from the yeah. WWE? Uh, Lanny Keene, he came in. Nice guy. El Bracero was there. Fred Curry. Bobo Brazil showed up. But whoops, Bobo's too old. We don't want him to wrestle. Oh. So they had, <laughs> they had Bobo be a manager, um, and I, I don't think Bobo came back. <laughs> uh, Flying Fred Curry worked a, a shot or wow. two. Uh, Sweet Daddy, Malcolm Monroe, I don't know, remember if he was no money or, or Sweet Daddy at that point in time, but he came in, and uh, let's see, uh, uh, Terry Tyler and the Polynesian Wild Man and Prince Mama Mohammed. Uh, yeah, it was Calypso quite a, Jim. Calypso, yeah, yeah sure, you know, absolutely. I'm or Boba Brazil yeah. Jr. as yeah. you know, he's known these days. Yeah, he was there, and then um, several others. Yeah, it was a nice little promotion. Good bunch of guys. Well, you know, it's like you know, Boba Brazil Jr. Now you had uh, Dick the Bruiser Jr. Now, wouldn't it be great if somebody came out as the Sheik Jr. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, besides Eddie Jr. <laughs> like, you know, uh, but yeah, wow, Dick the Bruiser, yeah. a legend. People and ask me about him all the time. What was he like? And you know, honest to gosh, I, even though you saw us together on television all the time, I rarely saw him other than when we were on camera. He came in, had his dressing room, and I didn't usually go back there because I just didn't get off hanging out in men's dressing rooms, you know, so I'd stay sort of by myself and, uh, okay, it's time to cut promos, all right, I'd come in one door, Bruiser would come in the other, we'd do the thing and away we'd go. Wow. Now, he was a, he was a, quite a piece of work as a commentator, a co-commentator. It was very difficult for me to get him to talk and I, I, I don't, discount the fact that maybe it was me. Maybe I wasn't feeding him the type of line or the type of a, 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 a cue or whatever you might call it that gave him something to, to come back to me with. Because I would say, well, what do you think of that, Dick? And crickets. Yeah, yeah, he, <laughs> yeah. Wasn't, he, he wasn't that great at commentary. You Not know. that <laughs> great, but he, he could be when he wanted to be. And, and as we went on, he got to loosen up a little bit because I, I would every now and then, you know, make fun of, uh, of somebody or laugh at something. And then because he was all about playing it straight initially, but then he had his little pet things that he'd start to get and he started to have a little more fun with it. So yeah. then, yeah, it got better. But one night right in the middle of a show, they, they came out to me um, and said, we're going to pull Bruiser off a of commentary and put Chris Carter on. And I said, no, you're not. I said, are you kidding me? This is Bruiser Bedlam. Dick the Bruiser is the reason, or a big reason, that people are watching the show. You are not pulling him off of this show, out of the middle of this show. 
Hmm. And, you know, the funny thing about it was I had no power to do anything like that, but whoever I talked to believed it. Yeah. <laughs> went back to whoever told them, said, no, Terry's not going for it. Yeah. But, yeah, you're Could have been a commentary less show from the rest of them. You know, I, we really have to do one thing and give credit to a uh, gentleman, uh, Richard Vysek, or Vicek, you know, Polish way, yeah. uh, about his Dick the Bruiser book. I can't say enough about this book. Uh, it's a great read. It's short chapters. And it tells everything from his childhood to his mother, you know, in politics, his, you know, parents, his, you know, where he grew up, uh, where he went to school, just every detail about the life of Dick the Bruiser that we didn't tell is in this book. And you can get it through Crowbar Press uh, through my really good friend, Scott Teal, uh, who does great you oh, know, wrestling the books. the best. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, so if you can, pick up the Dick the Bruiser book, uh, Crowbar Press, Scott Teal. Uh, you'll love it. I've got one other thing to do with Bruiser Bedlam. The Free Press in Detroit printed uh, a, an article just prior to Bruiser coming in talking about Bruiser Bedlam and the Premier Center, one thing or another. And they printed a, a caricature, a, a cartoon in the Free Press of Bruiser. And the tagline underneath the picture was talking about the fact that he has four dachshunds, doggies, four yeah. dachshunds. Their, their names were Duchess, Margaret Rose. His mother was Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> Spanky and Bo Peep. Yeah. <laughs> those were Dick the Bruiser's puppy dogs, his dachshunds. I forgot all about that when I was yeah. at the house. Those dogs were running oh, around. Really? Yeah. 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 But, I, boy, what a great episode. Yeah, you know, lots Or a two-part episode, yeah. you know, telling uh, about Dick the Bruiser. And as customary, Terry, you know, uh, we need an outro, your yeah. announcement on... I don't know, you know, the voice is a little rough today. I, I think you'd probably better be able to do this, take this one on your you own. You think I, I can handle I this one? I think you can handle it. He's okay. your buddy. Okay. DTB. Well, from introducing, from Reno, Nevada... Weighing in at 275 pounds, he is the most dangerous wrestler in the world, Dick the Bruiser.